to start us off today, we are very happy to have with us Matteo Maggiore from Stanford University to give introductory remarks on this topic and set the stage. So Matteo, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. You have uh, 15 minutes. Thank you, Lars. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and um, welcome everybody. Um, I was asked to give uh, introductory remarks uh, on this topic, which is really a pleasure because there's been a ton of research over the last 10 years. It also turned out that I was asked to write a handbook chapter about something quite related uh, for this week. Uh, so I had sort of spent some time thinking about uh, the literature. Um, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that over the last 15 years, um, oh, let me just switch um, to this. Um, over the last 15 years, um, there have been very severe crises with large policy interventions in financial markets and you know, QE, FX intervention. And it became more obvious uh, to everybody that the question of who owns which assets, it's an important one, not just at the micro level, but also at the macro level. And that has led to um, a big wave of theoretical work trying to incorporate financial market imperfections into general equilibrium frameworks, uh, both in closed economy and in open economy. And it's really also opened up the idea that we really want to know who owns it, which are the assets. And that one, you know, I think it's still ongoing, probably more so than theory. Uh, it, there's a big effort, which I will try to highlight across academia, policy institutions, uh, trying to collect data on capital allocations, uh, how firms and governments match with investors uh, in these markets. Uh, what I'll try to do today is very briefly uh, take stock of what has been done, uh, really very briefly, and then speculate a little bit about what's missing, what are we not doing well, where might we go next? Uh, which of course are just more of my own uh, musings. Um, where do we come from at a very broad, broad level? Uh, well, it's fair to say that international market has always paid a lot more attention to frictions than perhaps domestic market did. Uh, part of that is international markets are just by their own nature more segmented. Uh, there are more frictions, there is default, there is expropriation. Uh, you know, also the literature paid more attention to emerging markets that always had large crises. Uh, so you know, there, there was a continuum of this over time, but over the last 15 years, it has certainly accelerated a lot. If I try to go you know, deep back in time, um, I think a lot of us uh, find the NERC's view of capital flows generating destabilizing movements in exchange rates has really shaped a lot of the intellectual capital in the field, uh, as opposed to, for example, to Friedman, you know, stabilizing speculation. Um, a lot of the recent literature, including my own work, has really gone back to the work of Penticuri in the 70s, uh, the portfolio of balance approach to exchange rates, where currencies are imperfect substitutes and the demand and supply of these assets in different currencies uh, pins down the exchange rate. This was really a key insight that over time had gotten somewhat lost in modern models. Uh, part of that was a, you know, a lack of foundations. There was a model of the 70s uh, when you know, precise models, particularly from the Chicago school started to come around, uh, it became clear that making this statement stick in a general equilibrium model uh, is not as straightforward as one would think. You need to put a lot of frictions and segmented things appropriately. And it took a little bit of time to sort of figure out how to do this um, in, in, a, you know, in an easy modern sense. Um, here's how I think about uh, this kind of models. The traditional model, almost every model has, you know, countries, uh, you have the US and Japan, and they trade in the goods market with each other. Uh, now in most macro models, uh, that one is really extremely stylized compared to, for example, uh, trade models, but there's certainly variation. And then generally we have to decide what assets these two countries trade against each other. They might trade a complete or an incomplete set of assets depending on the model. Uh, models of sort of segmentation are a little bit different. Uh, they bring in a third set of players here, the financiers, and they make the trade in financial assets, here I have bonds, happen against these sort of central party. Uh, what are they trying to capture? They're trying to capture the idea that most of the world financial markets, particularly for currencies, are very, very heavily intermediated by some large players. And despite, you know, think of like the investment banks or the large asset management group. And despite the fact that these groups are big, so are the markets, and they have a bit of a finite risk bearing capacity. And so these models went back to the idea that these flows over here, the demand and supply of assets and the ability of the sector to intermediate, to absorb the, re the resulting imbalances ends up mattering for the determination of both the level and the dynamics of the exchange rate. This is sort of like one of the modern incarnation of one way to give a theoretical content uh, to um, the Penticuri ideas. It's not the only way, uh, but it's one way to do it. 
Um, now, to make things concrete, I'll review very briefly a set of equations that we put together with Xavier Gabex. Uh, if you like them, uh, you really should think of them as being part of the work I've done with Xavier. If you don't like them, you should certainly think of it as work done with Xavier. Um, but here's where they come from. Uh, so, you know, here is a very simple model. Uh, this balance here is what comes of the goods market. Is some model where it might have production, it might have sticky prices, but ultimately there's some imbalance that the world financial markets have to absorb that comes from trading the goods market. Here's my financiers, they absorb that imbalance, and here's the second period, uh, there is the same similar imbalance and the world ends, so every market clears. And really the crucial part is this part over here is the demand equation. It's a finitely elastic demand that says that the financier will intermediate more um, of the capital uh, depending on expected returns and depending on some elasticity of the demand curve. And you can derive this in many ways when we did them with sort of limited commitment and some walk away constraints. You can use BAR constraints, you can use other types of constraints. Um, and the nice thing is that then you can solve this simply and you get that the exchange rate is related to these fundamentals, uh, what comes out of the sort of trade market, but also to financial conditions. And so you can quickly think, Think of like examples where if I said the, the friction is very high, the world is in financial autarky and the exchange rate has to clear the goods market period by period. So it's tightly connected to the fundamentals. Or you can think of the other opposite extreme, like the offshore rug of benchmark. You make UIP hold. Finance is so relaxed that there are no risk premium. And then everything is a perfect substitute and the exchange rate is still tight to the fundamentals, uh, but it's the present value now of, of the future fundamentals. And in the middle, you can see that any exchange rate between these two can be achieved for a, set, for a certain level of frictions, which connects to the idea that these frictions might generate a big variation in exchange rates that is not so tied to the fundamentals. And therefore, to the idea that there might be an exchange rate disconnect. Uh, and Oleg, as I will review um, you know, a little bit later in the slides, has also worked on this. Um, now, that's the first pass. Uh, the goods market is pretty small. Generally, we try to think about gross portfolio flows. Again, the idea that where you trade in assets and how does that matter for the equilibrium? So here's a very simple example. Suppose that the Japanese wake up one day and they demand F star of dollar bonds. Just make it super simple, like, you know, noise demand. It's infinitely inelastic. They want to get hold of these bonds. Um, they sell an equivalent amount of dollar of yen bonds. So it's completely a gross flow. And what happens in equilibrium? Well, the equation is very similar to the one before, except that the yen will appreciate on impact. Demand is high for yen bonds, uh, sorry, for dollar bonds. Um, I said it wrong. The dollar will appreciate on impact. Demand is high for dollar bonds. The financiers have to absorb them in order to convince them to take the other side. Uh, prices have to move in general equilibrium and give, give them expected returns high enough to convince them to hold it. And you can see that this effect is completely absent uh, in either complete market models because the agents can unwind this or in models that assume UIP because the financiers will take the other side and just, you know, nothing would happen. Uh, so this is perhaps, you know, where, what these models have tried to capture. Now, of course, you know, you can go much more general. You can make the flows much more general. You can look at return chasing, carry trade, delegated portfolios. Uh, you can go back to the idea that there are monetary shocks and, you know, like John and Rose, you can link the frictions to the variance of exchange rates. You can look at infinite horizons and I'm not gonna get much into that, uh, but there's, there's a lot that has been done. Now, if, if this is the key, uh, what is the slope? How do we measure it? And is it even there? Uh, and there again, there's been very useful work uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Um, there's a paper for, you know, one set of literature went for what we call the reduced form approach. So these are inclusions and exclusions out of indexes. Uh, they create a quirky flow that is plausibly exogenous because the index provider decided to change things, uh, but nothing has happened to the country fundamentals. There's a very nice paper by Hao, Mass, and Perez where they looked at the MSCI restating the equity, an equity index and flows that are associated with that. Recently, Pandolfin Williams, together with Bronner and Martin, have done a series of papers using uh, quirks in how JP Morgan uh, weights the government bond indexes of emerging markets. It turns out that they do some very funky uh, sort of reweighting with kinks, which really helps the econometrician. In general, this literature finds very much like the domestic literature on stocks and index inclusion and exclusions, uh, causal evidence that flows matter for exchange rates in the direction that we just highlighted. More recently, uh, there's been also a structural approach, and today we'll see a paper from that, 
Uh, it's an approach that tries to import industrial organization supply and demand techniques and imposes more of a model structure. So compared to reduce form, uh, it comes with more baggage in terms of a theoretical model. But then of course the model allows you to make more statements. For example, distinguish between short run and long run elasticities. Uh, in, you know, elasticity within an asset class or across an asset class. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's a few more things that you can do. You can do counterfactuals. Uh, and really Ralph and Moto Yogo uh, have sort of started this literature. And today we'll see a, a paper, a great paper from Zhang, Richmond and Zhang uh, that will go deeper into this. Um, again, these are models that take a, a very different view of the data but find a very meaningful role for market segmentations in explaining the joint determination of portfolios and, um, and asset prices. Um, you know, we're at the beginning of this literature, uh, but you, know, you can see that the evidence is mounting and I, I like a lot of the different approaches that have been taken. Uh, now, of course, you know, I said that portfolios are key, uh, but I gave you a trivial example with just two bonds, uh, only trades in bonds, the markets are much bigger and much wider. Uh, so there's been also a great amount of work on this um, Elen, uh, together with uh, Hao and um, Kamano today, will present a paper on this looking at equity flows uh, and how equity flows might interact with currency flows because of partial hedging. And those can also be very big. Uh, very recently, uh, there are two papers from Greenwood, Hansen, Stein, and Sunderham, and Gorinchas, Ray, and Vallanos that look at long term and short term bonds. So they bring in um, a very similar um, view of the world uh, with the FX market, but they add uh, a yield curve, and they use the Vallano Villa sort of in seg segmentation model for the yield curve uh, to sort of jointly determine a term premia and current series premia across horizons. Uh, there's a lot of work on infrequent trading. I mean, if these flows are important, we have to take them seriously. Uh, Philippe Baquet and Eddie Van Wickham and have a series of papers, both in theory and in the data, trying to highlight how portfolios move. Um, I'm not aware, or at least I couldn't come up fast enough with papers on commodities and real estate. But there's certainly a lot of interesting work on government intervention. Uh, governments, as I mentioned at the very beginning, have become a very big player in these markets between QE, FX intervention, reserve accumulation. And so one interest has been, well, we talked about private flows, but what about government flows? How do they work? And here these models have provided a bit of a different answer uh, to the idea of foreign exchange intervention. So for quite a long time, uh, foreign exchange intervention had a bad name in academia. Uh, I think part of the reason is people use a Modigliani and Miller and sort of Ricardian logic to say that it shouldn't matter. Um, now, between QE and, uh, and the modern interventions, we kind of realize that, you know, Modigliani and Miller and Ricardian equivalents are very nice benchmarks, but they're unlikely to be uh, what drives the data. Uh, and also, there have been large policy experiments. Here I have Switzerland, uh, sorry, Switzerland, Israel and the Czech Republic. But Switzerland would look similar, that have gone through periods of massive effects intervention. And there's been a lot of great work trying to understand it. What are they breaking? Well, they're breaking the Modigliani Miller part. They're bringing in financial frictions so that the agents cannot simply unwind uh, the actions of the central bank. Uh, even if they fully understand that the central bank is taking positions on their behalf, uh, you're not going to be able to unwind them frictionlessly. That's where this literature is coming in from. Now, how does it work? Just to fix idea, let me do a very, very simple example. Suppose that you start with the simple model we had and you add sticky prices so that we have a role for production. And all I change is the letters. Q now is a, a Japanese government intervention where they buy dollars. But it works very, very similar to a private flow. What it does is it moves the exchange rates as long as there are frictions. Why? Because it's forcing the financiers like a risk transfer between a constrained financial intermediary and the government. And so it will have an impact on equilibrium prices. And in particular, it will have an obvious one. If Japan buys dollars and sells yen, it will make the yen depreciate and the dollar appreciate. How much? Well, in proportion to this. If you then add the real side of the economy here, I did an example with sticky prices where you have uh, output that is demand determined. So I have producer currency pricing. If a Japan depreciates its currency, it gets an output boost. Okay, it doesn't have to be realistic. It's just a way to get going. Then you can get into the idea of, is this optimal, not optimal? Is this welfare enhancing? And a lot of the theoretical literature has, has gone deep into this, trying to think about optimal policy, which I'm not gonna try to review here. I'm gonna skip this, because as, as always, we're running sort of short on time. But then also this kind of literature has, has given us a, a different view of both new issues and very classic issues. One part of the literature that I really love uh, is the cover interest parity literature that uh, Wang Sindhu and co-authors have been, you know, and Adrian 
have been very heavily um, influenced, sort of putting forward. I think their paper is already a classic as the first paper on my syllabus. Uh, you know, there's been a massive break in the arbitrage conditions in international macro. You don't see that very often. And models of risk premia uh, without frictions. So models that can generate imperfect substitutability across currencies via risk premium but no frictions are just not able to match these lacks of arbitrage. So it gave us really a nice ground for models of frictions uh, to get going. Um, Oleg, for example, has worked on the exchange rate disconnect together with uh, Dmitry Muchkin, uh, showing us that if you want to get to the exchange rate disconnect and the Musa puzzle, part of what you can do is not rely only on sticky prices, but actually make the financial shocks very big and orthogonal to how the firm change prices. That's going to move the exchange rate a lot, around a lot without moving the fundamentals a lot. So rationalizing a lot of these and giving us a different view of a classic puzzle like Moose. Again, going back to Adrian's work on the carry trade, um, other models can get this. It's very different from cover interest rate parity that is more tailored to frictions. Uh, but the models of segmentation have provided a view of the carry trade. Uh, they provide a very simple view. They say, look, there's a carry trade out there and capital tries to chase it and crashes in the carry trade are nothing else at periods when the financial intermediaries get very constrained. Uh, so volatility becomes high endogenously, the carry trade crashes and expected returns going forward are very high. That's one of the key patterns. It's by, by no means the only way to get it, but it's a very natural pattern in this set of models. Um, where are we going next? Um, well, I don't know. If I, I mean, if I knew I would be writing better papers, uh, but I can certainly speculate. Um, part of what I think it's sort of surprising is we know still relatively little about these portfolios. We made progress, but there's a ton that we don't know. The data is very imperfect. Uh, and I would say that recently there's been a lot of effort on this. Um, part of that is that after the global financial crisis, uh, we've realized that you know, this is a really important question, who owns the assets? And so the official sector has massively stepped up on data collection. You have the national statistics, you have central bank data, you have repository data trades on derivatives like EMIR. There's a lot of work happening there. Uh, commercial data is also improving very fast because the hedge funds, the, the big investment management groups are very interested in this. So mutual funds data, insurance companies data, for example, Ralph and, and, uh, and Moto have used, sovereign wealth fund data, all of that is becoming quite available. It's, it's attractive to academics because it's in some sense is a level playing field. You buy it, you use it. Uh, it's not proprietary data of a government. Um, so I think there's gonna be a wave of work there. I'm certainly working on that. Um, I, I hope to see a, you know, a lot more. Let me stop here uh, and leave you to two great papers, which I, I look forward to seeing uh, presented. All right, thank you so much, Matteo, for an uh, excellent overview. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Ellen Ray now um, so she can present her paper, Global Portfolio Rebalancing and Exchange Rates. Thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure to, uh, to be invited to this workshop and I'm going to uh, now share my screen. Do you see it? I can't see it yet. Okay, do you see go. it now? Yes, excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, great. So that was a, a super introduction by uh, by Matteo. So that's going to spare me the, uh, <laughs> the need to do any kind of literature review, uh, which is wonderful. I just want to uh, to point out a big picture idea here. We see, which is that in uh, in finance, uh, there's I think an increased interest and uh, an increased effort to to build models which are able to talk jointly about quantities and and prices. And in the case of international finance, that translates into models which are able to model jointly gross capital flows and uh, and exchange rate in particular, but also uh, asset prices. So uh, there's a a distinguished earlier literature that, um, that was mentioned by, uh, by Matteo, uh, trying to deal with these issues. There's a recent uh, revival uh, of that literature, and this paper is very much uh, into that uh, recent wave. Uh, if I have to pinpoint uh, one paper in the, in the current literature, which is the closest to what we're doing, I think it's uh, the paper by Ralph and, uh, and Moto Yogo, because we share uh, the, the view uh, of trying to uh, model jointly portfolio choice in different types of assets, which are imperfect substitutes. In our case, it's going to be equities uh, at home and foreign equities and also risk-less bonds together with exchange rates and to try to model jointly the, uh, 
so investment flows and uh, and exchange rates. So that's uh, that's the menu for for today. Um, so um, in in this uh, in this work, which is uh, joint with uh, Harald Howe and uh, Nelson Camano, uh, what we are uh, trying to uh, to present here is not a general equilibrium model. So in that sense, that's different from the work of. Uh, uh, Xavier and, uh, and Matteo, that uh, Matteo alluded to before. But on the other hand, what we are uh, trying to do is to endogenize uh, an optimal portfolio here, uh, together with, um, with uh, movements in the exchange rate in an incomplete uh, market uh, setup. So we are going to be able to do a joint determination of exchange rate, portfolio flows, and, and equity returns. Uh, while in the work of Xavier and, and Matteo, which is general equilibrium, uh, uh, but on the other hand, the, uh, the portfolio problem uh, is, is, um, is, not, uh, is not endogenized there. So that's the, the difference between the two approaches. So we are going to take a number of simplifying assumptions, uh, as you will see. But what we are going to get out of our model is that we are going to have some prediction regarding home bias. We are going to have home bias due to exchange rate risk. More importantly, we are going to have um, rebalancing uh, between domestic and foreign shares of the portfolios, uh, which and this rebalancing will be due to uh, valuation changes on the domestic and foreign share of the portfolios. This rebalancing will be uh, increasing with uh, exchange rate risk, uh, foreign exchange volatility. And uh, what is going to be, I guess, um, interesting about the model is that this uh, aggregate rebalancing flows will in turn affect uh, exchange rate dynamics. Okay, so that's, there's going to be really a complex issue here between the exchange rate dynamics and the equity returns and the portfolio flows. Now, once we specify uh, the model, we will also test it in the, in the data. And in order to do that, we are going to use a large international equity holding data set uh, in which we can explore not only the main mechanism, but we can also say things about heterogeneity uh, across, uh, across equity funds. So what will we find? We'll find in the data strong evidence for portfolio rebalancing as uh, predicted by, by the theory. Uh, this uh, portfolio rebalancing is amplified indeed by exchange rate risk. We'll also explore um, heterogeneity across funds, and we will find uh, some evidence of uh, uh, heterogeneity, which is quite, uh, quite strong. Uh, smaller funds will be associated to stronger portfolio rebalancing, and funds with less diversified portfolios will be associated to stronger rebalancing as well. And finally, uh, using a granular IV estimation technique developed by uh, uh, Xavier and Ralph, uh, we will be able to, to, to test for the causality of uh, the effect of portfolio rebalancing flows on the exchange rate. So that will be the last part of the presentation. Okay, so what is what does the model look like? Uh, it's uh, a priori quite simple. Uh, we are going to assume that there is uh, two equity markets, which are going to be two exogenous dividend flows, one at home uh, one in the foreign uh, economy. There's going to be also some local riskless bond in full, uh, full, fully elastic uh, supply. So the, the real interest rate will be exogenously determined and, 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 and fixed. And we will assume R equal R star to make uh, uh, the setup uh, symmetric and, and, and easier to deal with. Um, an important assumption is that the uh, foreign exchange uh, risk taken by the uh, uh, equity investors is not going to be hedged. So there is incomplete FX risk trading in this model, and that's really important. So there is exchange rate risk, and it will play a key role. In equilibrium, the exchange rate will be determined by the uh, demand from the flow dynamics coming from the portfolio rebalancing of the equity investors and the supply of the, uh, of the risk averse uh, foreign exchange uh, liquidity trader. Okay, so that's going to be supply equals demand, uh, and that will determine the exchange rate in equilibrium. So it will all be, I think, clearer once I show you the equations. Here are the investors. So these are the um, home and the foreign investors. Their equity uh, weights are going to be determined, uh, so are going to be denoted by H for home and F for foreign. Uh, the home investor doesn't have a star, the foreign investor has a star, so that's easy to track. 
uh, they are both mean variance investors. They solve the following optimization uh, problem here. What is important is that they value their profit in their domestic currency. Okay, so they value their profit in their home currency. This mean variance uh, optimization problem will uh, lead to linear asset demand functions. And uh, when they uh, do their optimal portfolio problem, they do not take into account their price impact on asset prices or on the exchange rate. Now, here are the two exogenous dividend process for the two stock markets. They are Austin Ullenbeck processes at home and, and abroad. And if we were in, in autarky, uh, we would have um, the fundamental value of the equity, which would be simply the expected present value of future discounted dividends. And we would have this very simple formula here, given the fundamental value, the FTH and the FTF. However, in the model, of course, it's not going to be uh, the, the value of the equity simply because we are going to have a joint determination of the uh, equity value together with the uh, exchange rate uh, and due to the uh, incomplete market uh, assumption that we have. So we have um, set up the exogenous stochastic process, the demands of the, uh, uh, the type of demand of the, uh, of the equity traders. So now uh, we just need to write down the market clearing condition. There we assume uh, that elasticities are in uh, uh, supply normalized to one in each of the two countries. So we normalize the equity supply to, to one. And that's the market clearing condition for, for equity. What about foreign exchange markets? So that's uh, uh, the kind of uh, important thing here. So the currency demand is uh, linked to the uh, portfolio rebalancing of the two uh, equity investors. So we have some currency demand which comes from dividend repatriation of the two currency of the two equity traders. This would be the two first term here in this DQT equation. They are linked to the uh, dividend repatriation. More importantly, the two last terms are linked to the portfolio uh, behavior, the portfolio rebalancing behavior of the uh, two uh, equity investors. So uh, they correspond to the change in weight um, due to their optimal asset demand. And ET is here the exchange rate. It's denominated in foreign currency per domestic currency, per domestic. So it's, uh, if ET goes up, it uh, corresponds to a foreign depreciation. Right, so now we have all the uh, ingredients except the currency supply. So this currency demand coming from the equity investment is met by uh, a risk averse global arbitrageur. We will have a price elastic uh, excess supply curve. And uh, there's an important parameter here, which we will estimate in the data, uh, which is kappa. So it's going to give us how elastic or inelastic the currency supply is. So we can think as this currency supply arbitrage as uh, selling a currency if it's high compared to its fundamental value, which could be thought as, so it's E bar here, it could be thought as a long run PPP value, for example, uh, or uh, we could augment uh, this uh, currency supply with a differential in interest rate if R was different from R star, but here we assume it's equal. Or we could uh, conceivably uh, also interpret this uh, currency supply as coming from the real side of the economy and coming from some kind of current account uh, relationship where, again, if E is above its long run value, we have a current uh, account uh, uh, deficit or a current account surplus in the other case. So there are multiple ways of interpreting this currency supply. Uh, I will just uh, take it as a reduced form and kappa is this important parameter, which is the elasticity of this uh, supply curve. Now the foreign exchange equilibrium is just currency demand equals currency supply. So this is uh, what this equation is telling us here. I just uh, redefined uh, net dividend income as these two terms here in a more compact way. And here this is the portfolio uh, rebalancing behavior. We have all the ingredients, the market current conditions, uh, the equity investments, and then the foreign exchange equilibrium. So. Uh, we can now uh, actually solve the model. And in order to solve this model, because of the exchange rates uh, interacting with all the terms here, we are linearizing it around the, uh, uh, the steady state. So we are uh, in this class of linearized models. What we can show is that there is a unique equilibrium. And this unique equilibrium uh, will be interesting if we restrict somewhat the parameter values. 
uh, this unique equilibrium will feature international diversification, provided that uh, the traders are sufficiently risk-taking and that the elasticity of foreign exchange supply is sufficiently large. In other words, if we had very risk-averse traders and an elasticity of forex supply, which would be very low, we would have so much volatility and risk that each of the investors would just invest at home and would not diversify their portfolio. So that would not be very interesting equilibria. So we are going to focus on equilibria in which uh, there is international diversification. And uh, for those types of equilibria, so we're going to solve for the two asset prices, for the equity prices, the exchange rate, and also the uh, equity holdings of both the domestic and the foreign investor. All right. Uh, so uh, what does this equilibrium look like uh, when there is international investment? This equilibrium uh, has the following feature. The price of a domestic equity uh, is a function has feature a risk premium. It features the fundamental value of the equity, which depends on the dividend flows. And it also depends on two extra stochastic terms here, which we also find in the price of a foreign equity in a symmetric way, since everything is completely symmetric in this model and which also feature in the exchange rate, uh, which is centered around one and also has these two uh, stochastic components. So as we see, there are common uh, stochastic components here, uh, pricing both the uh, price, the two equity prices and the exchange rate. And uh, the uh, dynamic portfolio holdings look like that. So what we observe is that uh, there is home bias, this H bar here, is uh, smaller than, than 0.5. That means that one invests more in, in uh, one's own asset than abroad. Why? Because here we want to diversify. On the other hand, uh, when we take some, um, uh, when we invest in foreign equity, we are facing an extra risk here, which is the foreign exchange risk, which is not hedged. And therefore this wedge between the foreign equity return and the domestic uh, equity return makes me uh, since I value return in my own currency, makes me uh, have a home bias portfolio. So I have a home bias in my, in my own equity, which is what we see here uh, with those weights. And then I am fluctuating around the steady state weights, uh, again, um, with uh, these this, uh, stochastic processes here, uh, the delta and the, and the lambda. So there is home bias in equilibrium, and there is some portfolio adjustment portfolio fluctuations around the steady states. So now, can we characterize better uh, these, um, these portfolio adjustments? Well, so the first thing uh, that we can note is that if we were in a fully elastic currency supply world, so in other words, if the, uh, uh, it's a bit like the uncovered interest parity uh, world that Matteo was describing in his introduction, if we were in a world in which uh, uh, the forex supplier uh, could uh, supply uh, the, the currency in an infinitely elastic way, then uh, the exchange rate volatility would disappear. So ET, the exchange rate would always be equal to its equilibrium, which is one here for symmetry. Uh, and the uh, price of the equities will always would always be their fundamental value price, uh, which would be a kind of autarky price. There would be perfect uh, global risk sharing. So each uh, investor would have 50% domestic equity, 50% foreign equity, would be a completely symmetric equilibrium with complete risk sharing and no exchange rate movement. So that would be an extreme case. Um, but in general, if the uh, guarantee supply is not fully elastic, then we are going to see portfolio rebalancing. So here, what is, what is happening, what we can show is that if we have an excess return on the foreign part of the portfolio compared to a domestic part of the portfolio, that means that uh, me as the domestic equity investor who is investing abroad, I've, I suddenly see my uh, a foreign share of my portfolio uh, being overvalued compared to my optimal weights and that exposes me more to exchange rate risk. So since I'm more exposed to exchange rate risk, I'm going to repatriate uh, some of my capital out of foreign assets into domestic assets. So I'm going to rebalance out of foreign assets into domestic assets in order to decrease my exposure uh, to, foreign, uh, to foreign risk, to foreign exchange rate risk, which I cannot hedge. So what we can show in this model is that there is a negative correlation between excess return on the foreign share of my portfolio 
uh, and uh, my investment abroad. So in other words, if uh, the return on the foreign share of my portfolio goes up compared to my domestic share, I'm going to be repatriating capital. That shows up in a negative covariance between DT, uh, DHF here, which is how much a domestic investor invests abroad, and the excess return on the foreign share of a portfolio compared to the domestic share of a portfolio. So the, the model predicts rebalancing, that is repatriation, when uh, the excess return abroad exists, ex when the excess return abroad is bigger uh, than the excess return at home. Another thing that uh, very, in a very logical and intuitive way that the model predicts is that if the foreign exchange risk is larger, that is to say, if the volatility of, a of the exchange rate is higher, then the intensity of rebalancing will be higher. So this coefficient, this rebalancing coefficient, which I just um, uh, showed you, be the covariance between DHF and the excess return, is going to be uh, larger in absolute value if the volatility of a foreign exchange uh, is actually bigger. So this coefficient of rebalancing beta, which is negative, is going to be larger whenever exchange rate risk is larger. Okay, so these are highly testable implications, of course. And this is what we are going to do. So we are going to test uh, these, um, these implications uh, using some very disaggregated data on international equity fund positions at the stock level, the fact set data sets. So we'll have more than 28 million holdings uh, positions. And we have uh, this uh, data at the quarterly frequency. We are going to look to have sufficiently large sample at funds located in four countries, US, Canada, the UK, and, and the Euro area. So I don't have time to, to get into the summary statistics. What we are going to first test in this rebalancing behavior. Do these international equity funds rebalance their portfolio when the excess return abroad uh, is higher uh, than the excess return at home? And so that's what we are uh, going to look at here. So in order to do that, we have to construct a rebalancing, a rebalancing measure. So we construct first a passive weight, uh, which would be the weight uh, of a certain asset in a portfolio uh, if uh, the fund manager is not doing any active rebalancing just due to valuation changes. So that would be the passive weight. And then we'll define the active change uh, in weight as the actual weight minus that passive weight. Okay, so that's going to be a rebalancing measure delta H here, which is the, the active minus the passive weight. And the test for rebalancing at the fund level is therefore going to be whether this covariance between this rebalancing and the excess return is negative or not. So that's going to be uh, what we look at. We are going to test that by running the regressions of uh, rebalancing on the excess return of a foreign share of a portfolio minus the domestic share, controlling for a time uh, domicile fund fixed effects plus fi fund fixed effects here. Uh, and uh, we are going to also allow for asymmetries. Is it the same if the excess return is positive or if the excess return is negative? So we will allow for asymmetries as well. What do we find? So first of all, uh, we are going to find that there is strong evidence for rebalancing in the sense that all these coefficients here uh, are negative and strongly significant. This is going to be true uh, if we allow for lags, uh, which, we, uh, which we do uh, in, colon, uh, in colon three and, and, and two, three and four. Uh, this is um, uh, what is maybe interesting is that if we allow for these asymmetries in terms of excess return being positive or negative, so this is going to be colon three, we don't find uh, evidence of asymmetry in rebalancing behavior. Uh, so there's no evidence there. If we split the sample before 2008 and after 2008, similarly, we don't find really any difference um, in the rebalancing behavior before and after the crisis. So strong evidence for uh, rebalancing is the first set of results that we have. The second set of results is about testing this interaction between exchange rate risk and, and intensity of rebalancing. So we interact the rebalancing coefficient with uh, foreign exchange risk. And so the coefficient of, uh, of interest here is the delta L, which is uh, the interaction coefficient uh, with the same uh, we have some same sets of, of, of controls as before. 
And what we find here, if you could focus on uh, the relevant colons are mostly the three and, and four here, uh, what we find is that there is indeed uh, evidence of stronger rebalancing behavior uh, when uh, the volatility of a foreign exchange market is higher. So that's uh, what we find. So interaction between volatility and strength of rebalancing. Right. So now this is what uh, the theory was telling us. But of course, uh, having this uh, very rich data sets with a lot of uh, international uh, asset positions in it, uh, we are keen to explore if there is uh, some heterogeneity. So what we do is that we are going to do that by uh, running some quantile regression to explore whether the rebalancing intensity could vary with some characteristics of a fund. So we now uh, write rebalancing regressions um, with uh, different quantile of the rebalancing variables. So what we, uh, what we get in terms of uh, uh, results here is that, uh, first of all, you have to look at where the zero is here. The zero is up there. So that means that all the coefficient, the rebalancing coefficient that we get are negative. So there is overwhelming evidence of rebalancing at all quantiles. But we do see that the rebalancing behavior is stronger at the extreme quantiles. Okay, so. Uh, strong, there's, in other words, very stronger rebalancing at the tails of the rebalancing variables. Everybody is rebalancing, but rebalancing is stronger at the tails. This is true uh, at lag zero, this is true at, at lag one. So we are now going to, um, uh, to explore a little bit who are these funds who are associated with stronger rebalancing intensity, so at the tail. And who are they? Well, we explore three dimensions of heterogeneity. One is fund size. The other one is uh, home bias, and the third one is fund concentration. We see that the funds which are associated with stronger rebalancing behavior are actually the small funds. As you can see from the histogram of size of funds here, the funds which are at the, uh, associated with the stronger rebalancing are the ones which are small. Okay, So smaller funds show stronger rebalancing, possibly because of transaction cost. On the other hand, we don't find really heterogeneity in terms of home bias, um, so that's, uh, that doesn't seem to be, uh, to be uh, changing anything. But we do find that the funds that are more concentrated tend to be associated with stronger rebalancing behavior. So two characteristics of the funds seem to be uh, associated with stronger rebalancing, small funds and more concentrated funds. Right, so that's what we get out of that. Finally, the last thing that uh, our, our model, um, of course, tell us is that rebalancing flows have an effect on the exchange rate. I mean, mind you, in our model, there's an equilibrium. So uh, it is the case that the exchange rate movements affect optimal investment. But conversely, uh, rebalancing flows also have an effect on the exchange rate. So what we uh, are doing next is that we are going to test uh, the effect of uh, rebalancing flows on, on the exchange rate. So one, uh, of course, easy thing that we can look at is simply a, a regression of the exchange rate change on uh, rebalancing behavior, on aggregate rebalancing flows, which we can construct by aggregating up from our microeconomic data. But this would really just be an equilibrium relation, so a correlation. And uh, ideally, what we want to identify is a causal effect of flows on, uh, on exchange rate movements. So we do run this wireless regression just uh, as a, a description of the data. Uh, and, uh, and, and we find a significant uh, coefficient. But what we really want to do is to, uh, to find a way of establishing causality of flows uh, on, uh, on exchange rate. So in order to, uh, to do that, we're going to borrow from the recent work of uh, Xavier Gebex and Ralph Cohesion, uh, their idea of a granular instrumental variable, uh, which is uh, intuitively very simple. It's about computing the difference uh, between size-weighted rebalancing and equal-weighted rebalancing, hoping that by doing that, we are getting rid of uh, common components uh, that could be correlated with uh, uh, the foreign exchange uh, supply. And by doing so, we would just be uh, uh, having an instrument 
with variation would come from the idiosyncratic shocks of uh, hitting the big fans, and these shocks would be orthogonal with uh, recurrency supply shocks. So that's, uh, that is the uh, identification assumption underlying the granular instrumental variables of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Ralph and, uh, and, uh, and Xavier. Uh, so we are going to do that, and that's going to be, uh, so we are going to effectively construct the GIV by taking this uh, difference between size-weighted rebalancing and equal-weighted rebalancing of the different funds, and therefore uh, putting the spotlight on the idiosyncratic shocks of, uh, of the large funds shocks. Uh, but uh, we are also going to be a little bit more sophisticated in that we are going to be uh, purging uh, the data first uh, from the uh, heterogeneity across funds. So we are going to construct uh, the instrument on the residual of a rebalancing purge from the heterogeneity that we uh, know exists in the data in terms of uh, fund size, in, in terms of uh, uh, fund concentration. So we are going to control for all that, for heterogeneity at the fund level. And we are also going to be controlling for 10 principal components of, uh, of fund flows. So we are going to be controlling for quite a lot uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, aggregate components here. So when we do that, so we have uh, several versions of the GIV. Uh, and, and as I said, we have a naive GIV, but we also have a GIV controlling for quite a lot of, of common components. And we will uh, do a two-stage um, operation here. The first stage, we are going to regress uh, the rebalancing, the aggregate rebalancing flows on uh, the GIV, okay, and uh, we'll see how strong the instrument is. And the second stage, we will regress the change in the exchange rate on the instrumented rebalancing flow. And here we will be able to get from this estimation uh, the elasticity of supply of uh, foreign exchange, which is uh, our, our little kappa here, which is one of the important parameters of our model. So we do that, and here is what we find. Uh, so first of all, whichever version of a GIV we use, naive one or much more sophisticated one, we find uh, a strong, uh, that, that this is a very strong instrument uh, here. And then using the instrumented flow, we are able to estimate uh, the elasticity of supply. And so here are our results here uh, for so highly significant and relatively stable. So uh, what does it mean in terms of magnitude? In magnitude, it means uh, our elasticity of supply of foreign exchange is relatively inelastic. It's not as inelastic as the macroelasticity that uh, uh, Ralph and Xavier estimate, for example, for the equity market. And uh, that fits well with the intuition that the foreign exchange volatility is not as high as the equity market volatility. And the elasticity that we find is uh, roughly of the same order of magnitude of elasticities that have been found uh, formally in the literature, in particular by, by Harald in, uh, in other papers, actually in a paper that Matteo cited uh, in his literature review uh, at the beginning of a, of a session. So to conclude, because I think I am roughly at the end of my allo allocated time here, uh, so we have constructed uh, an equilibrium in which uh, I guess the novelty is to jointly determine equity prices, exchange rates, and, and uh, so flows, uh, optimal portfolio flows uh, uh, together in a, in, a, in a setup where there is incomplete foreign exchange risk uh, uh, hedging, uh, so where exchange rates risk matters for portfolio allocation. Um, we have shown that this uh, model has a number of predictions in terms of portfolio rebalancing and in terms of linking intensity of rebalancing with uh, foreign exchange risk. We have tested these implications in the data and find uh, strong support for them. We have also investigated the heterogeneity uh, of the data using quantile regressions, and we found that smaller funds and less diversified funds have largest rebalancing propensities. Then what we did is that we uh, tested another implication of the model, which is that rebalancing flows have an effect on the exchange rate. In order to do that, we have constructed the GIV uh, instrumental variable strategy. And we've shown uh, that uh, uh, we can show effect of uh, rebalancing flows and exchange rate, and we find an elasticity of foreign exchange supply, which is roughly uh, such that 
about $7 billion flow are associated with a 1% appreciation in our estimate. So that's what we have done. And now I'm going to, uh, Great. I guess, leave. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing I answer the question later, right? Yes, so what we'll do is uh, we're going to hand it over to Oleg for the discussion now, and then we're going to do after that a 10 minute Q&A session. And so uh, at that point in time, we'll take some of these questions from the Q&A and in the chats, anyone please post your question as well as we're going to allow for actual live questions. So that's in 10 minutes though. So first, Oleg, please uh, go ahead with your discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Yes, so, uh, well, this is a, a very well-known, well-established paper in the literature already. So uh, I, I, it, it's been on my reading list for a while and I, I really appreciate that the, uh, uh, that the organizers actually put a deadline for me to actually read it carefully and in detail and try to sort out uh, everything what's going on. So um, yes, yeah, so it's, it, it's been a pleasure to read it. I'm gonna mention that it's, it's an intense paper to read. Um, and so it's also a paper that's pretty much advanced uh, in its life cycle. So the comments that I will give, I mean, they're mostly for discussion, I guess. I'm not sure to what extent they're gonna help the authors at this point, but maybe it will help uh, the future work on the topic. And I imagine there's gonna be a lot, a lot of work that in general on this topic and work that um, uh, emerges from this paper. Uh, so this is indeed, uh, as Matteo discussed in the introduction, and as uh, Ellen pointed out, it's 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 one of the papers that focuses on the interaction between portfolio choice and open economy and exchange rate determination. And these things are not very commonly uh, done in the literature. Typically, we focus on interest rate determination, and exchange rate. So think of UIP, CAP kind of uh, literature. That's typical. Doing portfolio choice is much less usual. So the papers that come to mind as probably uh, Pavlova and the Gabon from you know, 10 years ago, but more recently the work by uh, Moto and Ralph, but it's not done very often. And the reason it's a notoriously difficult problem, right? To do portfolio choice in the open economy, uh, let alone simultaneously with exchange rate determination, right? And so this paper indeed focuses on the portfolio choice of uh, mutual funds and how they rebalance their portfolio in response to shocks but it also endogenizes the exchange rate at the same time. And this is sort of like a big, a big feat to do it. It's, it's, it's sort of like notoriously difficult problem. Um, it does it in partial equilibrium. So this really helps. Uh, doing it in general equilibrium would be kind of fascinating. I'll try to talk, uh, I'll talk a little more about how it could be potentially nested uh, in general equilibrium. So when you think about this problem, think of like a Lucas trees in international economy, but endogenizing the exchange rates. Well, Lucas trees are kind of like uh, difficult by themselves, uh, but you add exchange rate and sort of like your head spins how complicated that problem is likely gonna, is gonna be. So the other thing I was gonna say, so this paper is, I think it's motivated by empirical work. So in a way theory plays a secondary role to empirics that at least was my reading that the goal was to write down theory that would inform the empirics given the data that the authors have. And because of that, I feel it actually justifies making some strong assumptions, right? To get to the structural equations where really, uh, you know, the data plays the key role uh, in the analysis. So I'm gonna talk really quickly about uh, the main insight. So my hope was, uh, it's like, I'm gonna read the paper, I'm gonna kind of study how it works and I will write a simplified version of, of the model to explain how it works. And then you realize it's actually quite difficult to write a simplified version, right? So things are actually, you know, quite involved, but the intuition is actually very straightforward. So it's, it's one of the cases where you can quite easily explain the intuition without the, uh, behind the results, but actually setting up the problem formally is, is, is quite difficult. And so the idea is that uh, you, you know, there are a couple of ingredients. One of the key ingredients is um, that uh, foreign exchange is an elastically supplied. So if you need to get foreign currency, you actually cannot get it uh, without paying a premium for it. And if the whole market wants foreign exchange rate, right, there's gonna be an equilibrium premium uh, for getting foreign exchange rate. Right? So it's the inelastic supply that they will try to estimate ultimately in the paper. And so uh, it, it, it's kind of, actually interesting that the same thing gives rise to home bias and portfolios, right? So the fact that when you're investing into foreign portfolios, 
right? You need the exchange to get it and you run the exchange rate risk. So both you need to pay for that exchange to get the foreign portfolios and you run the exchange rate risk. Well, it endogenously creates home bias, both in levels so that the domestic mutual funds will invest less um, in, in, in foreign equity, but also in changes and in changes, it's the rebalancing part, right? So if, um, if there is movements in the value of the foreign portfolio, there is an endogenous home bias and this change in the endogenous change in the home bias and response to that. It's kind of like a second order component of home bias, which is the rebalancing of the portfolios. And this is really uh, what they focus on. And so the result, the key result that they get is if you get capital gains on your foreign portfolio, if you get high return on your foreign portfolio, you actually become overly exposed uh, to, to foreign exchange rate risk and you want to shrink the share of foreign assets in your portfolio, that's the rebalancing. That's what they will you know, ultimately see in the data as well. So basically the domestic mutual funds and foreign mutual funds want to relocate, um, uh, relocate their positions towards actually home equity when relative returns on foreign equities are high. And so you get this outflow of money into the home, you know, basically capital market, which appreciates the home exchange rate. And that's sort of the intuition. And this effect, are stronger when there is more background exchange rate volatility. So in periods of high volatility, the rebalancing is stronger. So exchange rate movements will be strong. Well, I guess they focus on uh, in empirics on rebalancing, right? That uh, that basically high foreign uh, returns lead to rebalancing towards domestic portfolio and towards domestic exchange rate appreciation. And this affects a stronger under high volatility, right? And so this is this is what they do in the data, and um, and they find uh, evidence of this. They can do actually more in the data than they do in the model because they can slice the data in different ways and kind of uh, study the heterogeneity that they see across mutual funds. Um, Helen actually had a chance to describe it, so I'm not I'm not going to go into that. So I wanted to kind of you know. I, I saw Dorian Fitzgerald had a picture with the Lucas trees and it was beautiful and I tried to find it, but I couldn't. And so this is, this is really the best I could do. So think of like two islands, one, uh, you know, the home island and the foreign island and they have each a tree. It could be that the trees have both apples or one tree has apples, the other has oranges because the goods market is not quite specified. You actually don't know whether it's a one good or multiple good economy. So if you do general equilibrium, that would be the interesting thing. And then thinking about the real exchange rate and so on. But here, it actually really does matter. What matters is that each tree has a dividend process. And this is the only source of kind of shocks, right? How many, you know, apples and oranges you'd get in a year. And the prices of those trees are endogenously determined. But the point is that all this is in a foreign exchange. And so in order to buy that, you need foreign exchange. And so you have to go to intermediaries. And these intermediaries are not willing to uh, supply exchange rate without a premium. And basically this part is uh, what the paper shares in common when with, for example, majority GABEX with the intermediaries, you know, supply and, uh, supply and exchange rate. And so the point is, is, you know, whenever you have shocks here and here, and it leads to rebalancing, you need to go back to this market and this is what determines exchange rate, right? And so kind of, you can sort of see, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to oversee the structure of the model, but writing it down is actually, uh, is, is fairly complicated. And that's why I'm not showing you the equations really. Okay, so he, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead with my comments. So the, the first of the comments is, you know, it, it's interesting that theoretical predictions are so intuitive, but it's so hard to get like, um, kind of like to touch them, like really, really nicely in the paper, like the closed form solutions are difficult to get and so on. So, I mean, you have closed form solutions. And for example, you have this very intuitive results that as foreign exchange rate market, has more perfectly elastic supply of currencies. This just collapses back to the Lucas tree model with like half and half shares and you know no home bias and so on. So this seems super intuitive, but just seeing it in the formulas is so difficult. And so I wish there was like a way to illustrate, you know, that that you know, like that limiting case analytically, so you can see those portfolio shares, but it's it's just difficult. And I, I couldn't really see a you know an, an obvious way, but I felt that. Uh, this would have helped a lot because the model otherwise feels a little complicated, even though intuitive. A related thing is I didn't always get a sense of whether what you show are kind of quantitative possibilities or very robust results independently of what happens to the dividend, for example, process and so on, or you had to pick you know, a particular process for dividends to give you those results about rebalancing, right? Is it always the case that high returns on foreign uh, portfolios lead to rebalancing away from the foreign portfolio. That seems to be a quantitative possibility, but not necessarily the you know general implication of it. And then the question is, can we study more the conditions uh, when it happens? And you know, 
you might need to correct me if I'm kind of clueless here, but, but that, that was my impression from reading the paper. At the same time, the model has very strong assumption. I'll talk a little bit about the, them later, but so I felt that maybe, you know, you may, maybe given that the assumptions are already strong, maybe you want to make them even further stronger so that you get more analytic characterization, right? So like once the assumptions are already strong, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe it makes sense to push it forward, but I don't have great suggestions for you exactly how to do it. Um, um, yes, so the second set of comments is more about empirics. Um, so one thing I was kind of curious, can you do more to figure out what's the source of the high exchange, uh, of high return on the foreign portfolio? Is this like the discount sort of news or dividend news, right? Because it's not obvious to me that the rebalancing response will be the same independently of what triggers the high return on, on the foreign portfolio. So is there a way to do a decomposition of those returns and kind of know what caused the high returns? And it, it, it quite well could be possible that if it's dividends, uh, you not necessarily need to rebalance away from it. But you know, if it's if if if, if it's higher valuation uh, of the foreign tree now, maybe this is the reason that you become overly exposed to that risk. And so I, I thought it would be curious to look at it both empirically and theoretically. Actually, if something could be said about that. Obviously, the model has a dividend process, and uh, prices are determined by the dividend. There is really not. I, I don't think there is much room for the discount trades. But in the data, we know that discount trades drive a lot of the of the returns. Um, yeah. So I, I, this is a quick question. I was kind of curious in the mapping in the theory. The portfolio rebalancing is like the shares of the tree. In the data, I imagine it's in the value terms, right? So I was wondering how do you do that mapping between in the model thinking about the, you know, in terms of the shares, in terms of kind of the real units of the tree into the portfolio shares, which are like in dollar terms in the data, I imagine, right? And so uh, I was I, I was not quite clear how you do the correction for that mapping. Uh, well, the other thing is the sequence that you test on the data is that high foreign returns result in rebalancing and you empirically test that link. And then you test the link from rebalancing to exchange rate movements. So you separately, you test two links uh, uh, separately. But then the question is if we kind of do the whole thing, it means that high foreign returns result in home currency appreciation. And so I, it, it did not strike me immediately as the obvious consequence that you would expect that high stock market return abroad is the uh, source of domestic currency appreciation. I was wondering to what extent that link is kind of unconditionally true or it's only true condition on a particular types of shocks. You have a little bit of a discussion of this that there, are, you know, there could be effects through financial markets and through goods market and then you would wonder which one dominates. But I didn't see how sort of the empirical work kind of got to, the, to that condition because the first stage was pretty you know, pretty unconditional, right? And so then I was wondering, does it mean that, you know, financial effect always dominates, right? And then we do expect exchange rate depreciation if domestic market is doing well, you know, domestic stock market is doing well. Um, yeah, very quickly, two things I was going to mention here. So in order to interpret results structurally, that, that kappa elasticity, the elasticity of foreign exchange rate supply, you really need, I think, to have the universe of agents that demand currency. If it's not the universe of agents, and if these agents happen to be correlated with other types of agents that demand currency, for example, the bond traders, you know, the noise traders of various sorts in the market and so on, what you obtain is uh, it could be, you know, an elasticity that has the correct sign, but I'm not sure that it has an unbiased value because you sort of have an omitted variable problem. And perhaps there is a reason to think that different agents, actors are correlated in the market. And so it's not enough to have an exogenous instrument. You actually have to, I think, for the unbalanced elasticity, you need to have the universe of people that demand currency in a given time. And if they're correlated, uh, you would get a bias even, even with the instrument. Obviously, correct me if, 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 if I'm wrong here. The, lastly, I was going to think, I mean, uh, granular instrument variables is this fascinating new tool to use. Uh, I was kind of curious that the OLS estimate and the instrumental estimates are literally the same. I mean, they differ by like tiny magnitude. They quantitatively the same, statistically the same. So what I was wondering, is there a way to like see what this construction of instrumental variable is doing, right? And you're taking a weighted average and you subtract the unweighted average, right? But the question is maybe unweighted average is just a bunch of, no like maybe unweighted average does not really represent what happens at the aggregate at all. 
So like if you regress aggregate quantities on the instrument and on just the weighted thing, you literally get the same feed pretty much, right? Because you're kind of like subtracting a piece that's unweight. Like when you work with the firm level data, which I know much better than the financial data, if you take unweighted average of firms, right? You just capture lots of noise, which is not informative about the aggregates oftentimes. And right, I was wondering, is there a way to kind of prov like, not just appeal to granular instrument variables, but provide some, uh, you know, degree of confidence that, you know, it deals with the endogeneity problem. I'm not sure how to do it, but like some slicing of the data that, you know, you really are not using the aggregate trends again, when you construct the instrumental variable, but you're using the high order moments, like it's implied to do. I mean, that, that, that would uh, make me much more comfortable. This last thing, I mean, I, I will take maybe a minute or two on this. Uh, my specialty is really just general. One just one minute, please. Okay. One minute. My specialty is general equilibrium modeling. And so, I mean, Matteo already discussed it it's in the introduction. What I was going to say, it's really interesting that this could be nested in general equilibrium. And so if, if, if you know, if somebody is in search of a, a PhD thesis, this could be a pretty good idea. And so the way I think about it, the goods market, and this is what we explain in detail with Dima in our paper. So the good market results in equations of this sort where these are like net foreign asset accumulation. And this is essentially the exchange rate that leads depreciation leads to uh, you know, trade surpluses, right? So this is just the intertemporal budget constraint together with goods market clearing. And so this would be something like a you know, stand of asset demand equation. So essentially what you guys do, you kind of drop the goods market altogether. You kind of get rid of that and you replace a more conventional demand for assets where you have like excess returns divided by the variance of the position, you, you, you replace it with this kind of thing, right? And, and, and the two together would do pretty much similar job as this guy. And so I think it's possible to write it down in general equilibrium where you have, you know, two dynamic equations that sort of give you when you do co-integration, they give you a static equation like this. So you have to make strong assumptions that you know, supply of foreign exchange is a function of level of exchange rate, not the change. Typically in financial markets, we think it's all about the changes like in the UIP equation, right? Because you buy today, sell tomorrow, you do it in levels, you motivate it that it's mean reverting. You, you really don't have to make any of these assumptions if you did it in general equilibrium. I actually think, I, I, I don't feel bad about these assumptions because I think doing a general equilibrium model will kind of give you reduced form equations that look similar, but that, that requires a bit of extra work and I think uh, actually somebody could do it. What I was the most fascinating by is this actually point is that you completely can. So typically the way we think about financial market is that there is the fundamental macro stuff like net foreign asset positions run by the country to buy and sell goods. Then there are noise traders and then there are intermediaries. The amazing thing, well, you get rid of the goods market side but the amazing thing that you can completely get rid of noise traders. And so I was kind of fascinated that one can write down a theory of exchange rate without appealing at all to noise traders. And this is fully replaced by endogenous portfolio rebalancing. And so I was, you know, I was the most intrigued whether how far one can push, you know, general equilibrium model without appealing to noise traders and doing everything through portfolio rebalancing. Well, this, this requires a much longer discussion, but I think this is sort of like, this was the fun part for me. And I think it would be really fun to try to do it in general equilibrium. And so here's like another paper to be written, I think. Uh, thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Oleg, for a great uh, discussion. Um, so uh, we are kind of running late. I'm going to um, take one question live from the chat, and then I'm going to give you a chance to, to respond to both that and the discussion, Milan. Uh, so if you could get Alessandro Rabucci uh, from Johns Hopkins. Hi, Alessandro speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, great paper and presentation and the discussion. Uh, I'm going to ask a question to um, Helen that I asked before, but I understand it a little bit better now. What are the implications of the analysis and the setup for the global financial cycle? It seems to me now that I better understand the paper that if we take a, a view, a US centric view where we put the US at the center and then there is the rest of the world, the, the implication could be at least partially be fully consistent. I wonder whether though that view is, uh, is the right one for equity trading where perhaps there is more bilateral trading uh, going on all the time. And I agree with Oleg that uh, uh, the granular IV is perhaps less of a silver bullet in that asymptotically, when you have uh, uh, a large cross section, the weighting should not matter. So the fact that it matters, it may be picking up some, uh, some, some noise and some, some, some small, uh, small sample bias here. Thank you.
All right, thank you. Ellen, you can respond to that and also if you want to respond to the discussion. Yeah, so thank you very much, first of all, to Oleg, yeah, as usual, <laughs> given a great discussion. Um, so I just want to make a few points. So first of all, Oleg, we, do, we did try to simplify as much as we could the, the model, uh, but very interestingly, you know, uh, in order to simply do that, do an optimal portfolio with a joint determination of exchange rate, we pretty much went bare bone and, and that's where we ended up. So it was very hard to do anything uh, more simple. So it's, it's kind of um, amazing that in a way, throwing in so many, you know, simplifications and uh, you know, bare bone model, you still end up with something quite complicated. And, and, and I do think it's because you have this two way interaction between the portfolio choice and the exchange rate determination and, and whatever you do, if you're gonna keep that, it, it, it's, gonna be pretty, it's gonna be pretty difficult, I think. So unfortunately, um, we, we did try. <laughs> Um, I, I think it would be super interesting to, to, to uh, but, but I'm, uh, for, for another paper to do what you say about decomposing the, uh, the uh, excess returns into uh, different components, so shock on discount rate, et cetera, but th that would be a whole empirical project. I mean, we did look uh, in the past with Harald actually at link between excess equity return and exchange rate movement. And unconditionally, we did find something uh, that we kind of called at the time the uncovered equity parity condition, because there was this kind of co-movements between the uh, differential inequity return and, and the exchange rate. Uh, that was an unconditional uh, relation. And so I think it would be uh, indeed uh, interesting to, to explore this further, but that's, that's, uh, that's a big research thing to, to, to do that properly. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm probably not gonna do that in, in that paper. Uh, it's a, an important point about uh, the elasticity. So the elasticity indeed here is linked only to this uh, rebalancing flow. And so indeed, they are not all the flows. Uh, they're only part of the flows, uh, first of all, in the equity space. Uh, but also, uh, there could be other flows conceivably on uh, coming from bonds flows. I mean, as you, as you mentioned, and, and they could be correlated or not. I mean, the thing is, it seems, uh, it, it seems like uh, from an international investment point of view, uh, equity investments are not hedged usually for exchange rate risk, while uh, bond, uh, bond investments are, are hedged. So this has implication for, uh, uh, for exchange rate determination. I mean, if, if, it is, if the world is as simple as that, bonds flows are hedged, but equity flows are not hedged, then uh, this interaction with the exchange rate comes purely from the equity side and not from the bond side. Uh, now in practice, we could have, you know, some time variation in the hedging behavior, et cetera, and that's gonna interact. Uh, and, and, and there's some, uh, some nice recent paper uh, on interaction between exchange rate and hedging recently in the literature. Um, but uh, so we, this is something we are, we are not exploring. So here we are kind of uh, relying on the fact that equity flows are somehow more important for exchange rate than, than bond flows because of this asymmetry in hedging. Uh, then we still have the issue of how much of the flows are we, are we capturing on the equity side. And uh, so compared to the CPIS data in the recent years, we are, you know, it, it, it's, it's quite a bit of coverage, but it's not full coverage. So then are the other flows fully correlated or not? I mean, that certainly would affect this, uh, this number, uh, uh, this, uh, how much of the flow you need to move the exchange rate by 1% would be affected by, by this. So that, that's definitely something that, uh, that is absolutely, uh, uh, you know, valid as a uh, as a comment. Okay. Um, just yeah. One just oh, one minute. minute. Okay. Yeah, so on the granular instrument, uh, uh, yes, so Alessandro, it could be that indeed we have a big cross section, and so uh, that's uh, uh, that, that could make our estimates more similar. I mean, uh, we and and also Oleg had, had uh, comments on that. I mean, we we are trying to really refine the uh, basic naive. Uh, uh, granular instrument estimates by really controlling for a lot of things. So first of all, purging from the heterogeneity of fund characteristics, and so constructing the GIV on the residual. And second of all, by uh, controlling for all these principal components uh, of the uh, balancing uh, flow uh, matrix uh, in our regressions. So uh, we are we are being as you know as exhaustive as we can there. Uh, and th there are a few differences uh, between the various estimates, but it's true that the differences are not that large. I mean, uh, that's one on the one, and so on the one, that means it's pretty stable, this, uh, this elasticity estimate there. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, uh, Alessandro, so I'm not sure. So the thing is, for a global financial cycle, you do want to introduce some asymmetry, presumably, in, uh, in your world economy. And so here we are dealing with an asymmetric world, so I, with a completely symmetric world. So I would say the, the thing I see which could be relevant for a uh, global financial cycle style literature is that you have these uh, joint uh, movements in, uh, in equity returns and, and, and exchange rates here, which come very naturally from the uh, endogenous portfolio uh, determination. Uh, and so this is something that we seem to see in, these, in all these co-movements of the global financial cycle literature, but uh, you know, to apply it more to the US, et cetera, I think we, we would want to have a more asymmetric model, which we, we don't have here. So that's again for future work. All right. Thank you, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you so much, Alain, and thank you, Oleg, uh, for a great presentation and a discussion. I'm sorry to have to, to uh, cut this one off now and move on, however, to our next great paper, uh, which is going to be our portfolio approach to global um, uh, exchange rates or global imbalances, sorry, uh, presented by Robert Richmond. Okay, is my screen clear and you can hear me? Yeah. Go. Okay, great. So this paper is with Zhengyang Zhang and Tony Zhang, who are both here if you have any questions. Let me just start off here showing you the trend that we're actually interested in here. If you look at the US's net foreign asset position over, say, in our particular case, the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, you'll see that there's been a large decline in the aggregate net foreign asset position for the US. These are portfolio positions primarily because of data constraints that we're working under. But you can see here, going back to 2002, as a percent of 2002 GDP, the US net foreign asset position was about minus 10% at the beginning of the sample, and this has declined to about minus 35%. Now you can break this down into the different components. In particular, we can look at this as the net foreign asset position in equities or long-term debt and short-term debt. And what you see is that within the US's portfolio, they run actually a positive asset position relative to their foreign liabilities in terms of equities. The main driver of this trend over the long run has been the decline in the long-term debt position of the US vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. In this paper, we're going to be interested in studying this trend, which has been a kind of a key focus in international macroeconomics and finance literature for um, over recent periods. Now, what are we trying to do? Look, there's large differences here between the foreign asset and liability positions in the US as well as other developed countries. We'll be very interested here primarily in the US, but we could extend this to study other developed countries. Indeed, the data is actually there uh, in the underlying approach that we're going to take. Now, work by um, Helen and Pierre Olivier, for example, has suggested that these imbalances have been driven both by quantities and price adjustments. And I'll come back to this later, but in the context of our setting, we'll see that having downward sloping demand curves will allow us to think about nice ways to decompose how changes in quantities of positions held by countries endogenously affects the prices. Well, the literature has suggested a number of potential explanations for this decline in the US net foreign asset position that we've seen. We're going to break them down into a three different categories. So these are kind of rough categorizations of what the literature has suggested. Um, the first suggested uh, reason for this decline in the US net foreign asset position is this global savings glut. Indeed, going back to a speech by, for example, Ben Bernanke in 2005, which suggested that foreign investment opportunities were not as prevalent for these foreign investors. And so there was a global savings glut that drove foreign investors to purchase US-based assets. A second explanation goes to studying the official holdings, both of foreign central banks, as well as the US Federal Reserve. Over the last decade, for example, we've seen large increases in quantitative easing, as well as changes in reserve positions of foreign banks. And a third explanation for these, this trend in the net foreign asset position was shifts in demand of investors globally. Indeed, there's been a large literature that has studied demand for SACE assets, as well as changes in risk bearing capacity, um, of different investors globally or different issuers of assets globally. And so the goal of this paper is going to be to actually decompose this change in the new net foreign asset position into these various components using a structural framework. So the challenges up to this point with the literature is that the, there hasn't been a joint quantification of how much these various forces matter. Now, to account for kind of 
this rich structure of substitution that occurs globally, we're going to need a number of things. We're going to use, build on a framework, uh, as Matteo suggested, that's going to allow us to use holdings data, in particular bilateral holdings data of countries globally. This will allow us to estimate a demand system where we have rich substitution between uh, within asset classes, so you can imagine an investor investing in equities globally, they'll substitute across different countries, as well as substitution across asset classes, that is across debt versus equity um, in this system. Now, importantly for this point that I made about quantities and prices, is that in this setting, asset prices uh, and uh, capital flows, or the quantities held, are going to be endogenous. Um, when you have imperfect uh, it, if demand isn't perfectly elastic, then any changes in quantities will actually endogenously affect prices. This will be an important component in our setting, which will allow us to further understand what has driven this change in the net foreign asset position of the United States. All right, so what specifically is our approach? We're going to use a demand-based asset pricing model to understand this long-run variation in the U.S. external portfolio. We're going to add on a couple of key components here. One of the key components that we're going to have is we're going to have endogenous wealth dynamics. Indeed, we're going to allow for endogenous adjustments of investors' wealth to the capital flows that occur in this system, uh, as well as to other changes in the underlying demand curves. Oh, hi, Rob. I think the slides are frozen. They're frozen. Okay, let me yeah, check. We're still seeing motivation. Can you see that now? Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Okay. So what are going to be our main findings here? The main headline number that we're trying to study, as I showed on the first slide, was this decline in the U.S. net foreign asset position, at least in their portfolio position, but it also occurs across other components of the aggregate net foreign asset position. Here we're going to be looking at this decline from minus 10% of 2002 GDP, which was about $1 trillion to uh, minus 32% of 2000 GDP, which was a decline to about 3.5 trillion US dollars. Now, one of our headline results is going to be that the savings glut alone suggested that US asset portfolio position would have declined by 76% of 2002 GDP. So the exercise here is gonna be keep all of the other constituents of the demand system constant, that is demand with respect to particular characteristics and all of these, and just allow changes in quantities invested versus assets issued and see what the counterfactual change in the US net foreign asset position would have been. And this would suggest that this would have been 76 per, minus 76% of 2002 GDP. We're gonna show that the vast majority of this effect actually originated from growth in developed market savings. Beyond that, we're going to add on changes in official holdings. So we saw large changes in reserves as well as quantitative easing by the U.S. Federal Reserve. If we add on this additional component of changes in the official holdings of central banks, we would have seen that the U.S. portfolio position would have declined to actually minus 94% of 2002 GDP. Uh, in the paper, we show that there was significant spillovers between the central bank purchases of debt to the actual equity prices. Uh, that occurred, and this is happening because demand curves are imperfectly elastic in our system. Now, how do we get back to this minus 32% of 2000 GDP, 2002 GDP that we saw in the actual data in this trend? Well, we're gonna show that this final component of changes in demand, I'll be specific about this in just a second. This is actually gonna offset uh, these changes that we saw in the global savings glut, as well as the official holdings, and put us back to the minus 32% of 2002 GDP. And so a key takeaway from the paper is gonna be that by using this structural system and rich data on portfolio holdings, we're gonna actually be able to decompose this trend into various components and see that underlying the simple trend in global imbalances lie various forces that go in different directions. All right, I'll just briefly kind of highlight the related literature here. There's a large literature on drivers of net foreign asset. Um, dynamics. We're going to take kind of a finance perspective and use a portfolio uh, choice approach to study some of these changes in net foreign assets. We're going to be contributing to and building on the work and demand system based asset pricing that has been mentioned a number of times. We're going to use this kind of finance perspective on this to try to answer a question about quantities 
uh, and in particular the net foreign asset position, which is a big question on the international macro and finance side. Uh, we're going to be able to contribute to this literature on uh, unconventional monetary policy to understand how quantitative easing and other changes in reserve positions has affected the U.S. net foreign asset position. All right, so let me set up the uh, framework here, and then we'll talk about estimation. So there's going to be N countries which issue assets. There's going to be three asset classes. They're going to be labeled one, two, and three. Asset one is short-term debt. Asset two is long-term debt. Asset three is equities. Each asset class contains an outside asset, which is going to be indexed by zero. And then there's going to be some evolution of the quantity supplied of asset N in country L, right? So there's N countries, they issue assets. Those are labeled by N. The quantity issued is QT or the quantity outstanding is QT in that particular asset class. And it evolves according to some exogenous process, right? It just evolves at the time T value, and then there's some change between time T and T plus one. And there's gonna be I investor countries that can purchase all of these assets. These investor countries are gonna allocate some assets under management, which is labeled AIT. So how does the demand structure work in this setting? Uh, there's gonna be some weight that investor I puts on country N's asset in asset class L, it's going to have two components. It's going to have some portfolio weight conditional on investing in that particular asset class L, and then it's going to have some portfolio weight across asset classes, right? So this is the total portfolio weight on equities, debt, or long-term uh, by invest by uh, investor I. Okay, how is the portfolio weight within asset class L structured? Well, conditional on investing in asset class L, that portfolio weight is going to be a logistic function that is going to be a function of a few critical things. Why is it a logit? Well, if you look in the data, the portfolio weight distribution is approximately log normal. This ensures that these weights sum up to one here um, and gives us something that's tractable to actually estimate that data. How do we specify this function delta? Delta is a function of expected returns in investor I's own currency, as well as some asset characteristics and some latent demand, which is unobservable to the econometrician, but is used so that we perfectly fit the cross section of holdings that we observe in the data. Just a side note, you can derive this functional form as a function of characteristics if the characteristics themselves are good proxies for, say, riskiness and growth rates of some under of some um, returns on the assets. You can see this in Ralph and Moto's previous work. Okay, so we're gonna use a nested logit for cross asset substitution for this portfolio weight in asset class L. There's more details on that in the paper. Okay, so a critical addition that we're gonna add on to what is a kind of the standard um, demand system asset pricing at this stage is we're gonna have some endogenous assets under management for each of these investors. Well, the assets under management of investor I at time T is equal to whatever their AUM was in the previous period. And now you just need to consider what the portfolio weights were on say asset K. You're gonna have some gross return that was obtained between time T minus one and time T on that asset. This return is endogenous. When, down, when demand curves are downward sloping, an increase in the purchases for a particular investor's at, uh, asset is going to increase the price of that asset. So we need to take into account this endogenous return. We're also going to have flows. So investors can add more assets into the system. They're going to distribute those assets based upon their demand functions. We will have some exogenous flows that allows us to understand how, say, increases in savings has affected the net foreign asset position in the system. Then we're going to need one more equation. We're going to have a market clearing equation that just says the total value, right, price times quantity of each asset N or country asset N is equal to the total demand by all of the investors plus the total demand by the central banks. BIT is just the quantity demanded of the central banks. Okay, so what is the data we're going to be working with? We're going to be working with the IMF's Coordinated Portfolio Investor Survey. So this is the first reason that we're constrained to going back to 2002. This data only goes back to the early 2000s. 
I want to flag again that what we're studying here is the portfolio positions of countries. There's also this additional component in the aggregate net foreign asset position that would include things like FDI or bilateral bank holdings. We're not studying that here. Our investors include banks, corporates, and households, and governments, excluding central banks, though, we're going to use this data from the SEFER, which gives us aggregate holdings by central banks of particular assets. And we'll use data from the US Federal Reserve uh, to understand uh, holdings of US assets by the US Federal Reserve. Now, it's become kind of well known that there's issues with residency um, versus um, nationality in this data. So we're by, you know, Mateo, Jesse, Brent, um, and Antonio has shown that financial tax havens can distort this data substantially. What we're going to do here is we're going to use their reallocation matrices to redistribute holdings based on nationality. And for numerous reasons, we're going to combine the EMU to be a single investor country. One last point on the data. The CPIS doesn't allow us to observe domestic holdings directly. What we're going to do is we're going to take the total market cap of a particular country and subtract off the aggregate holdings that we observe from the CPIS to impute domestic holdings in the country. All right, we need some asset characteristics because the demand curve here is a function of asset level characteristics. We're gonna use some characteristics that have been shown in the literature to proxy for both currency and macroeconomic risks. So we use GDP per capita, we'll use a measure of trade network centrality, uh, we've got numerous measures of macroeconomic risk, so GDP, um, we've got inflation, sovereign default probabilities, and we've got some bilateral variables, bilateral trade exposures, distance, and stock market volatility. Um, asset prices are going to be market to book ratios for equity. We we'll use 10-year government bond yields uh, for long-term debt. And we're going to include a U.S destination dummy to capture the fact that it, there's a large literature showing that the US and dollar based assets have particular characteristics that investors demand. So we have 43 investor countries, 36 issuer countries, the data runs from 2002 to 2016. So how are we going to estimate this? We're going to follow the literature on demand system asset pricing that Ralph and Modo. You can see if you take logs of our portfolio weight function that in logs, this is linear in expected returns, which we estimate using a forecasting regression with prices and exchange rates in there, as well as the characteristics and latent demand. Now, as soon as you're estimating a demand curve with portfolio weights on the left-hand side and something with prices on the right-hand side, you're worried about endogeneity concerns. Why is that? Well, you could have a large investor that has a particular affinity for an asset class. That is, they have a large kappa for that particular asset class. That would mean they have a large portfolio weight there, but with downward sloping demand curves, this high latent demand will also influence the price of the asset, which shows up in this expected return here. And so it's possible that there's an endogeneity concern. So you need an instrument for this expected return. What we're gonna do is we're gonna follow the previous literature, we're going to use the structural model and in particular the market clearing equation to estimate implied instruments. What do we do? We estimate this equation, but just with sets of characteristics that we can take as plausibly exogenous here. We use kind of very, very persistent set of characteristics, GDP, distance, just an investor fixed effect to estimate counterfactual portfolio weights assuming that we just used those instruments. And then we use the market clearing equations to compute predicted portfolio weights, which are W hat, which gives us an instrument and a cross asset regression. And then we also use the demand system and the market clearing to compute counterfactual exchange rates and prices that clear the markets, which eventually gives us instruments for this expected return here. How are we going to do that? Okay, so we've got all the estimates in the paper in more detail. What I want to show you here is just a few of the key coefficients and highlight some of the estimates of the within asset demand. The cross asset demand uh, parameters are shown in the paper as well. What you he see here is that conditional on characteristics, investors prefer assets that offer higher expected returns. 
Indeed, this implies that investors exhibit downward sloping demand curves. You also get reasonable coefficients on some of these measures that are representative of riskiness of assets, things like GDP and centrality here. All right, now what I want to do is kind of get to the key results of the paper. Let me just first talk you through what the exercise that we're going to actually study here is. Here I've put, not, put the key equations from the paper all onto one slide here. The first is the assets under management evolution. The second is the market clearing equation. And the third is portfolio weights. Now, on this slide, what I've done is set all of the exogenous variables to be in black font and the endogenous variables to be in red font. Okay, so exogenous variables are things like central bank holdings, it flows into the system, as well as the supply of assets here. Endogenous quantities are things like the portfolio weights, the actual prices. And so how are we going to do this? We're going to proceed in three steps. We're going to first set all of the exogenous variables back to their 2002 levels. The endogenous variables are going to stay constant. And what we'll do is we'll first work to understand the global savings glut. How much did the global savings glut contribute to the dynamics of the US net foreign asset position, holding all of these other variables constant? So what we'll do is we'll restore savings and asset issuance to their actual levels over time. And we'll reuse this demand system to recompute prices. And we'll see what would have happened to the US net foreign asset position. The next step will be, okay, Keeping the demand parameters constant, what would have happened if you had the global savings glut and increases in central bank holdings? So we'll also allow the central bank holdings to return to their actual levels over time. Again, recompute prices and look at the US net foreign asset position. Finally, what we'll do is we'll restore the demand parameters. Demand with respect to the actual characteristics of the assets, the latent demand, and then the latent demand with respect to asset classes. So this is across asset classes. Well, once we've restored all of these variables to their, to their levels over time, we'll be back at the data. But looking at what happens to the actual net foreign asset position in each of these scenarios allows us to attribute the long run trend in the net foreign asset position to each of these different possibilities. So here it is. What we're gonna do first is show you the data or the last step, which is the component where we turn all of the endogenous or the exogenous variables back to their 2000 level, to the levels. This is the trend that we've been looking at from the beginning of the talk. Now, if I set all of the exogenous variables back to their 2002 levels, we'll be at what I would call the baseline. That is, you would just stay at this minus 10% of 2002 GDP because nothing actually changed in the system. Okay, so what do we do? We then turn on asset issuances and investor savings, the F and the Q, to understand how much this difference between issuances and the amount of savings affected this position, keeping all of the other variables constant. What you see is that the US net foreign asset position in that case would have declined to about minus 76% of 2002 GDP. All right, so this is a dramatic widening relative to what we actually observe in the data. Next step I want to show you is related to the idea that prices are endogenous in this system. So you have changes in quantities. That is, you have an increase in investor savings relative to the amount of assets that are issued here. That drove some of this trend. But we also have downward sloping demand curves in this system. So this increase in purchases also led to changes in the prices. So what we can do in this system is we can say, let's assume that we just looked at this actual value, but keeping prices constant. So look at what the net foreign asset position would have been with this global savings bug turned on, but don't allow prices to endogenously adjust. Well, what you can see is that in that case, we would end up, up at about minus 42% of 2002 GDP, the additional component comes from the endogenous increase or endogenous changes in prices in this system. Okay, what about 
emerging market savings versus developed market savings. Well, because we have the entire cross section of portfolio holdings, we're able to decompose this, at least in terms of the private investor savings. What you see here is if we turn on just EM only, that private EM savings only would have lowered uh, the torn asset position by a few percent. A lot of this comes from the developed market, at least private investor savings. Now, of course, the caveat to this is that a lot of savings that occur in emerging markets is through the central banks of emerging markets, at least when in the typical narratives of the global savings club. So the next step is going to be, let's understand what would happen with official holdings. Unfortunately, we don't have disaggregated data by EM or DM of the actual central banks. All that we can observe is just the aggregate position of foreign central banks in a particular country. But what we can do is take our savings glut counterfactual and allow the reserves positions of these central banks, as well as the position of the US Federal Reserve to change. And what you'll see is that official holdings actually lower the US net foreign asset position even more. Okay, the final step is going to be to restore the demand parameters, right? The, char the characteristics of the assets, the latent demand and the latent demand with respect to particular asset classes. What you see is that going from this official holdings line takes us back to the data. These demand shifts capture, say, changes in allocations from both these observed and unobserved characteristics. And you can think of these as changes in the demand for certain assets that can't be attributed uh, to changes in actual price. These demand shifts largely off offset this large decrease in the U.S. Uh, foreign official holdings position. Okay, so the last exercise that I want to talk about here is to try to get closer to this notion of exorbitant privilege that has been talked about in the literature. So the last exercise that we actually do in the paper is we ask the question, how much additional long-term debt can a particular country issue until the yield on their long-term debt increases by 1%? The idea here is to try to understand, okay, how much privilege does a particular invest or a particular issuer country have in terms of the demand with respect to their assets. So what you see here is I've taken the G10 and I've just ranked by billion dollar billion US dollars of debt that can be issued such that the yield increases by 1%. Okay, what you see here is that the US could issue 1.6 trillion dollars in additional long-term debt uh, until the yield increases by 1%. Next up is Great Britain, then you've got Germany, Japan, and so on. Now, maybe this isn't the right scaling in your mind. It's because this takes into account exchange rates. Of course, everything's in US dollars here. You could do this as a percent of domestic GDP, which you see is actually quite interesting. If you do this as a percentage of domestic GDP, you see that actually Great Britain turns out to have the largest amount that they can issue um, until their yield increases by 1%, whereas the US ends up down here for about 7%. Okay, so let me conclude here. What we've done is we've adopted a demand system approach to examine the global imbalances in the US net foreign asset position, in particular the portfolio position. We showed that the global savings glut and official holdings both contributed to the widening of the US portfolio imbalances, whereas these shifts in demand of investors offset these large increases that occurred due to the savings glut and official holdings. Now, these countervailing forces aren't directly observable in the raw data. And so using this structural approach allows us to better understand jointly how various forces that have been talked about in the literature affect this key quantity, U.S. net foreign asset position. So I'll end there. We're looking forward to Adrian's comments. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, and so the discussant is Adrian Verglehan. Thank you. Can you see the slides? Yes. Can you hear me? Cool. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, the organizer, for asking me to uh, to discuss this paper. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, I was told that I should not uh, summarize the paper, not talk about the paper. So okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that, that slide just to tell you it's a really cool topic. They have a wealth of data and some pretty um, some pretty provocative results. So okay, I skip that and I immediately go to my discussion. And so my discussion has three points. First, the basically three suggestions. 
One is a suggestion about the data to try to um, raise the bar a little bit and show us the data slightly differently. The second point is about the identification of the demand versus supply. And the third point is about the simulations and the kind of assumptions we need to interpret those. So why is it a great topic? Well, I'm standing in front of it, but um, it's the net foreign assets position um, that Rob showed you. Here I'm looking at all the assets, in, including uh, FDI and everything. And as you can see, um, okay, as you know, the, the US runs uh, a trade deficit uh, year after year. You see the cumulative current accounts uh, going down, down, down. But the net foreign assets is also becoming very negative. But you see this big difference between the net foreign assets and the accumulated current accounts. And that's a point that uh, uh, Hélène and Pierre-Olivier made a long time ago. We have made very interesting um, valuation effects to, to study here. And I'm going to come back to this point. I also want to highlight something that actually, actually um, Matteo pointed out to me. Look at what happened um, in, in the last two years with this really strong deterioration of the net foreign assets position of the US. I think there is something here to study. And the sample in the paper stops in 2016. I think adding the next four years is going to be really, really cool. OK, that said, you have the kind of data they, they have to play with. Um, I'm looking at the aggregate at the US level. So it's kind of the balance sheet of the US, if you want. On the left hand side, assets. On the right hand side, liabilities. First row, equities. And, uh, and the second row, bonds. And as you know, um, the U.S. borrows a lot of money from the rest of the world, and the U.S. invests in foreign equity. Okay, so we all know that. Now, what we're going to do is that we're going to look at the changes in those positions, not just at the aggregate level, not just the U.S. versus everybody in the, in the, in the world, but at the bilateral level, the U.S. versus the U.K., year by year, the change in those, um, in those positions. So my first suggestion is um, to do that with a little, uh, a little think on top. Think about the position, the assets position of the US versus the UK. If the, the uh, equity position increases, it's either because the US invests more in the UK or because the value of the UK assets went up, right? Okay, we can look at those two components. And uh, actually, we can actually even more, be more precise not just the flows versus the valuation, but when we think about the valuation, what is coming from the exchange rate versus what is coming from just the value of the stock market in the UK, just to take the example of equity. And so what I'm showing you in, on, this, um, on this simple graph is again, the balance sheet, um, assets on the left, uh, uh, liabilities on the, on the right hand side. But now I'm looking at changes year after year over pretty much the same um, sample period as in the paper. And what you see, I think, relatively easily, uh, graphically, is that um, when you think about equity positions, a big change in big driver three of those changes comes from the valuation thing, the red bar, right? And so you could decompose those red bars again into exchange rates versus price changes. If you think about um, that, it's mostly about flows. Okay, so we have two different um, uh, drivers, if you want, of those. Um, of those, of those positions, it would be nice to know what the, what the model says. Now, by definition, by construction, the model matches all quantity and prices. So at the aggregate level, I assume it's going to look like this if you have the right set of prices, right? It should. Um, but at the aggregate level, I don't have the decomposition country by country. So I like to know when we talk about the exorbitant privilege, who is paying that to the US? And I think the model can tell you that if you get into this uh, kind of decomposition of valuations versus, uh, versus rules. So that was my first, uh, my first point. My second point is about um, the point that actually uh, Rob, uh, Rob made. Um, as soon as we regress prices and quantities, there's always someone in the audience who says, oh, you could also regress quantities and prices and vice versa, right? sure. Um, and the problem is, of course, that even if the residuals of our two equations, like uh, eta and epsilon, are uncorrelated, we, we are in trouble because we can measure the volatility of the prices, the volatility of the quantities, and maybe have covariances. But that's three moments. And you see in the little uh, uh, equation system that I have here, I have four unknowns. So there's no way you can estimate this, right? Uh, maybe um, state I can give you something, but it's, uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit random. So that's, of course, extremely well known. Um, and the way 
we usually address this is by coming up with an instrument. So what are we trying to do? You know, I just relied on my two equations, demand and supply. Um, of course, that's, uh, there's nothing uh, deep at, at this point going on. The, the, the idea of the instrument is just that you have a set of variable, a vector variable uh, xt, that's driving both uh, the, the demand and supply uh, curves, but somehow you can find one of them, and I'm going to call xt uh, sub, uh, subscript k, and that one is going to shift the supply curve, but is somehow uncorrelated to the demand curve. And I know yeah, it's like I'm just repeating um, first year uh, graduate course, right? But it, I, it kind of helps me to just go back to some very simple and basic thing like this. I should find an exclusion restriction. It has to be that one variable has no impact on the demand curve and that same variable has some impact on the supply curve. And when you look at the way it's done in the paper, because of course they know this, right? They explain that they start with some exogenous characteristics like GDP, bilateral distance, investor fixed effect, uncountry dummy, and then they solve somehow the system, use the magic of the market clearing mechanism, and then come up for some uh, exchange rates and prices are gonna be used as instrument. But when you read it, it's not obvious that it's gonna work, right? I believe it's gonna work, but like exactly how is it gonna work? So my second suggestion would be to just again, go back to the basics as I just, as I just did and do what, what Hélène uh, did in, in, in a presentation, show us the first stage. The relevance condition. It's completely fine if the, if the instruments are built in some sense by the model, but once they are built, they exist. So show us that the instrument explains some variation in quantities. I'm just, what I have in mind is a simple uh, first stage graph that you see in every corporate finance uh, presentation. Uh, here's the thing that should move, and then there's an instrument on the horizontal axis and some kind of cute bin scatter plot. Let's just do this. And then let's go for the exclusion restriction. Why doesn't the instrument change the demand curve? And um, to me, it's not obvious. I mean, maybe because I'm, I'm clearly not an IO person and I don't know this literature well enough, but I was trying to think about in the model, take out all the log it and exponential or whatever, in the, in the model, what is driving, for example, the US holdings of foreign equity? And I can see an equity fixed effect. I can see some expected returns, like I would have in any, um, Partial equilibrium portfolio problem. And those expected returns seems to come from the book to market ratio and the exchange rates. And I can see a bunch of assets and country uh, characteristics market value, book value, the free month and the 10 year interest rates, inflation, GDP, GDP per capita, sovereign default risk, trade centrality. I think I have almost everything at this point. And then there is the thing that um, is the residual, the thing that we don't explain. And then we call the US a latent demand for equity. And we have even a latent demand for equity in each foreign country. But when I see this long list of things that could be uh, driving both prices and quantities, I'm not sure which one is not driving the demand, which one is driving the supply curve and not the demand curve. To me, it's not obvious because I think I could almost come up with a story for GDP, inflation, even the, what, what is the dummy? Um, an investor could be more risk averse than another one, uh, even at the country level, and that may have some implications for. Um, for, for everything we see in, in both in on prices and quantities. So I think here, yeah, the, the exclusion restriction is always the, of course, the very difficult part uh, to argue for, uh, but um, just a little bit more explanation would be really, really nice. Okay. My last point and third, my third and last point, it's about the simulations. What do we do after estimating uh, the model? But it's, it's amazing to be able to estimate this model on so many countries with this kind of, again, this wealth of data is kind of, wow, cool. So we're gonna, we want to use it. And they use it in two different uh, experiments that uh, Rob um, mentioned. The first one is to assume that all agents maintain their 2002 holdings, for example, and then you relax this assumption for a different set of agents one by one. And each time you do so, you solve for the equilibrium prices and the portfolio allocations. Um, so that's actually a pretty, pretty cool experiment. The second one, as I mentioned, is uh, let's look at the amount of debt that has to increase in order for the interest rate to increase by 1%. And I think it has to increase by more than three times what it increased before in order to, to have this kind of um, uh, increase in interest rates. By the way, this could be, it would be cool to compare this to what all this sovereign risk literature in um, following Eton and Gersovitz uh, would actually um, 
imply because in, in this kind of models um a one percent change in, in exchange rates would, could come with a lot of a uh, lot of more debt but we, 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 can, we can talk about that when i think about those experiments the first thing that comes to mind is the lucas critique right um and, and um so if you remember the lucas critiques uh, in 1976 um Lucas uh, give it in the, in the in the context of uh, inflation and employment and there's a negative correlation between the two and he says well government shouldn't try to create inflation because as soon as uh, the governments do that um, firms are going to change their expectations about future inflation and it's going to change their firm policy and I'm wondering if there's not a little bit of the same that could be uh, at um, at play here well if you go on with the inflation uh, um, example if the government um, produces a lot of inflation or a lot of um, money, a lot of debt, you would assume that actually people are going to price this debt differently. The, the default risk could actually become very important and the increase in interest rate could be even much bigger than what we've observed over the previous um, previous 20, 20 years in this sample. So where does this really um, show up in the, in the, in the, in the way the, the simulation is done? I think, if I understood correctly, not sure, but if I understood correctly, we are assuming that the impact of each characteristic on the portfolio choices does not change across regimes. So you have one regime defined with a set of investors, for example, doing something, and we assume that the estimation that was run with all the uh, investors, everybody else in the full sample is still valid. And, and so is it, is it possible um, for small changes? I think I could certainly make a, a case that maybe investors are not going to change the way they view each characteristic. Maybe when I see a, a large firm, still a large firm, even if it becomes a little bit bigger, or if uh, the government um, prints a lot of money, it's like there's no link between the two. But when we think about large changes, I think it's kind of a stronger assumption to assume that people are not going to revise the way they think about uh, allocating um, their um, their assets and how they think about each characteristics. You know, even if they, even if we actually have, we have to re-estimate the uh, importance of each characteristics, it's not obvious that the latent demand thing that on the other assets would not change. So I think there's a big um, kind of a big question here. I don't fully know how to address it, but um, that would be I think a really nice way to um, make the paper actually clearer on this. So to finish on time. It's a very interesting topic. It's a great paper. I learned a lot by reading it. I'm excited to read this one in the next version if there is one. And I just have three uh, simple uh, suggestions. First, tell us more about the flows versus the valuation changes. It's a, you can do this. So just give us the result. I think the results are already there in your simulation. On the identification, I would say, go, let's go back to the basics. Show us how powerful the instruments are. Explain why they are the, the ones we should uh, we should use. There's such a large literature. So, so many people are just spending their lives on this. It's, it's important to, uh, to to address them. And on the simulation, let's explain how it addresses those different, um, basically the Lucas critique in different different um, settings. Thank you very much. I stop here. Great. Thank you very much, Aiden. It was a great discussion. Um, Rob, I'm going to give you a chance to uh, reply. Yeah, no, thanks for a lot of really helpful comments, Adrian. Um, I guess I can talk specifically kind of about each of your points. So on the, the, the first point on quantities versus prices, yeah, I mean, that's the, the next step for sure. Right now we kind of show the one aggregate graph there for the, the savings glut where we set things to 2002 prices, but we, we should do it in aggregate and make sure that that is consistent with the sorts of patterns that we see that like Helena has documented with capital gains uh, versus quantities and, and, and understand that more. So it's certainly um, the next step there. Um, on, on the identification, yeah, so I, we don't have it there, but we can sh show you more. The first stage is actually quite strong um, in, in this setting. So we, did, we don't have like a, a big concern about that, but we can certainly walk through more on you know which of these and perhaps i think another thing to do would be some robustness with respect to the exogenous characteristics that we use for uh, the, the instruments in the first place to kind of see um, how that works the third is uh, a tougher point um, in the sense that look one thing that we can do is 
try to see how stable the demand with respect to characteristics of different investors are over time. Now that doesn't directly address the Lucas critique because the, the, the concern is of course that when we're doing the counterfactuals that uh, th that might change. So I, I think the next step uh, in, in part of this agenda would be to try to endogenize the plausible things um, in the context of the model, right? So what, what you do is you have the actual demand curves, so you have an interesting demand side, but then you have to start to endogenize uh, what happens on the supply, whether it be something that happens with uh, the, the issuances by, you know, uh, the governments or something about inflation. But that, that I think, to, to fully address that Point. You, you know, in, in our setting now, it's very much we do have to take the demand curves as structural to be able to estimate these things. Um, but I think you can derive some of these from more first principles, perhaps going forward. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Rob. So we are actually out of time. So I'm just going to conclude then. And uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to our presenters. And, uh, and especially big thank you to the wonderful discussions today. So uh, that's it. Uh, hope to see you all soon. All right, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.